Good evening. Welcome. Good to see you guys tonight. Uh, my name is Adam Jeffert. I'm the manager of the Asia Pacific Design Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, as always, I have some housekeeping, but to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them and to the elders still living today. The location of the State Library on Kurupa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people. We proudly continue that tradition here today. So seventh lecture tonight, um, second last one of the series. Great speaker tonight, I'm excited as always, but maybe even more so um, to hear Chris speak. Housekeeping wise, toilets are on level two and three. Um, in an emergency, please move to your nearest exit, either up the stairs or to the doors just here. If you do need to leave during the lecture, could I please ask that you exit through the rear door? Um, if your phone isn't on silent yet, could I get you to put it on silent? Um, there is a hashtag, of course, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, that you can follow along and, and tweet comments if you like. The stream tonight is also on Facebook and on Design Online and also through the UQ Architecture page for those following along at home. Hello. Um, Design online, videos, reading notes, transcripts, and of course, if you choose to write about the lecture tonight, we would love to share your thoughts. You can send that through to us and we will publish it for you and you get those CPD points as well. My final little B, uh, piece of housekeeping tonight is to let you all know that the winner of the ArchiSpy competition will be announced next week at Lecture 8. Um, we're excited to let you know that the prize will be a private tour of the Hayes and Scott's uh, mid-century Jacoby house. Um, and for those of you in the know, I understand that it is a lovely house. I haven't been there. I'm looking forward to it and looking forward to taking one or more of you along as well. It's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Sandria Cargio O'Grady, Dean of Architecture and Head of the School, to introduce tonight's event. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for coming tonight. One of the joys of being part of the architectural community and growing old in it is watching your friends have successes. So when I met Chris, uh, 10 years ago, the practice was then just three or four years old because they started their practice, David and Chris started their practice in 2004, so 12 years after graduation. And since then, they've been in what Chris describes as a slow burn. So what we're going to see tonight is work that's very thoughtful um, and has been steadily maturing, becoming richer, and more and more interesting as their projects also get bigger budgets and more, more and more exciting pro provocations. So they started off small, they're getting bigger and getting bigger projects. It'll be great to see their journey tonight. So welcome, Chris. Um, Thanks, Sandra, and thank you all for coming along this evening. Um, each time that David or I are asked to speak about our work, it's a real opportunity to step back from day-to-day -day practice and examine from a different perspective what we do as architects. So teaching, which David and I also do, um, we're teaching at Newcastle Uni at the moment, is also another mechanism that forces that kind of reflective practice about our process and our position. And it is, I'm just going to work this out as I go, there we go. It is in this context that we as a practice have evolved our approach over the last 13 years. So starting as many practices do, um, with alts and ads, in our case for a good friend, progressing to larger residential projects and more recently building a body of work in the public realm as well. But who and what are we? I'm assuming that not all of you or even many of you know of us or our work. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of who we are. So we're modern-ish architects. What does that mean? We consider our work with a broad modernist sensibility. Um, we look for clarity in the process of making buildings and spaces, 
but we try not to be constrained by the dogma of a materiality or austere functionality. I think this Dieter Rams radio kind of um, epitomises some of the things we love about good design, modern design. We like to respond and evolve rather than to react to program and context. And we often talk about this as a responsive design approach, and I'll mention that a few times tonight. So the idea is that there's never a blank slate, that the existing conditions of a site, an existing building, an urban context or a brief must be understood, and that the design must respond to this um, social, environmental, economic context on many, many levels. But coherent design is not just an accumulation of responses. So we're interested in the culture of ideas, in history, and we use these to find meaning in our architecture. And where possible, to look for, find or introduce the atypical and the unexpected. We also enjoy the spectacle of the ordinary, the delight of well-designed things, no matter how small a handle or a light fishing, a window opening, or even a dog kennel. And we have designed several dog kennels, many of which the dogs won't go near, but they're beautiful to design. And in all of this, we're concerned about the social and environmental repercussions of how we make our architecture at all scales. The consumption of our cities, the sizes of our homes, the quality of our public spaces, and the resources that we use. We try to use our skills as architects to explore the ideas that drive our cities and the model of housing and city making and how we can challenge the prevailing paradigm to make things differently. And this project, um, just as a quick aside, is one of those um, ideas that we've tried to explore. It's called the urban worm and it explored the idea of how to make best use of that last metre or so of unused space at the back of the suburban block. So, Tonight I'm going to talk about a range of our projects, some in more depth than others. I'll skip over a few pretty quickly because I'd like to cover a bit of ground. I'll look at residential, public and commercial projects, all quite different, but all conceived through this lens of being modern-ish. So in this first project, we explore these issues and the idea of an evolving story of a house, working with history at a personal level. So, house six, in an urban environment. At the rear of this house, we found, it's a typical terrace, but at the rear of the house that you can see on the right-hand side, we found sort of evidence of the previous chapters in the life of the house, and we like to think about it as the life of the house to which we're adding another chapter. A series of elements that were accumulated over time, kitchens, laundries, terraces, stairs, all sort of added randomly to the back of the house. And rather than eradicate this history, our approach was to selectively remove some elements and add some new chapters to this story. So this approach is inherently loose and it requires a conceptual advice to make sense of it, a way of thinking about the composition. So the massing of the house was treated as an oversized still life. This Giorgio Mirandi still life inspired us in the studio to create our own, of more pragmatic composition of found objects, which helped us to compose, think about how to compose a series of small and considered interventions. So taking that and translating that through a pal palette of modest materials, we set about creating these new forms alongside the existing ones. We constructed this lantern to draw northern light into the rear of the house. We created complementary spaces um, that responded to the needs of the young family who lived in the house and connected these spaces to the changing skyscrape, trying to create this generosity of space within the inherent modesty of this project that only added six square metres to the house that we found originally, hence house six. That's one of the quick projects. So building on that, um, in 2009 we undertook a project um, that explored ideas of history and memory. And to do this, we employed the idea of material reuse and material codes to um, give us ideas about how to explore history and memory. We had a 19th century house that had to be transformed into a home for a, a contemporary family. 
So Fitzroy Terrace is one of seven Georgian terraces built in 1845. Um, this was a drawing of the front facade. It looks like a grand mansion, but it is in reality seven terraces. And you can see it here sitting in a beautiful garden context, although it is in the heart of Sydney. But at the rear of the terrace, it had been considerably altered over time. Elements in field, items added and many items taken away. There was a real history and progression to the additions. So to start with in the design process, there is of course the general arrangement of spaces, the response to heritage constraints. And you can see on the right hand side um, up there, there's the original two front rooms of the house, quite typical in a terrace house, and at the back, a, what had been previously a detached scullery. So within that framework, we had strategies for achieving natural light and ventilation, how to incorporate services into a heritage, state heritage listed house, adding and adapting the spaces for modern living, just straightening out the program, basically. But the fundamental ideas around this project was a considered response to the building and the elements that we found. So through a process of peeling back layers, through carefully removing material, considering how that might be reused and incorporating it into the new work. Fundamental to this was an exploration, in this exploration of history, was the establishment of a series of codes and rules for the contemporary adaptation of elements. New elements being painted, um, recycled elements left raw. Here you can see straight ahead a new opening where we cut and expose the original fabric in the new openings and then the left, the dressed openings, like with the, you can see the arched brickwork on the left there were um, dressed with timber. And here again, the dressed elements on the left but also revealing the original fabric, retaining the patina of the old, like the bridge here that you can see that connected the original house across to the scullery, now revealed was hidden underneath other elements of the house. And always the new inserted elements deferring to the existing elements. So where the kitchen and the clearances in the kitchen didn't quite fit around the old house, the new elements give way to the old. And always the new contrasting with the old to bring both into relief. The new always proportionally and materially distinct from the old. And then finding inspiration in the patina of old structures and materials, the things you can't fake. Finding opportunities in a crack or a crumbling edge. So here the old outhouse that was on the laneway was extruded across the site to create this new studio that then bookends the site and activates the rear yard. So the set of rules here that we established in the treatment of old and new interventions gave us a framework within which we were able to experiment with the existing and recycled and new materials to create a building which is rich in variation in surface form and colour and texture. So I've talked about this idea of a responsive design approach. The idea that there's never a blank slate. And a new house that we did in Venus Bay in South Gippsland, which is in Victoria, um, provided us with an opportunity to explore this responsive design approach in, re in respect of landscape and climate as a counterpoint to much of our work, which is um, in, with existing building stock and in urban environments. So here in Venus Bay, um, the climate is relenting, unrelentingly hot and brutally cold. Um, the wind feels like it's blowing straight off the Antarctic, and often I think it is. Um, but the site had these beautiful characteristics, a protected thicket of tea tree bushes which ran along the edge of the long thin site, um, providing perhaps another constraint, but perhaps also an opportunity. And our other opportunity was an elegantly simple brief that we had from our clients who wanted an unpretentious, pragmatically built house that would protect them from the elements. And this completed the context in which the design was formed. But a coherent design couldn't just be realised out of the accumulation of responses to these elements. 
So to unlock the design, we required a point of departure, which is something that David often talks about. Something to help us explore the ideas, a device that we can worry at and see if the ideas underpinning it fit. So our solution was this exploration of the longhouse form to fit with the long sight. Building on our work with terrace houses in an urban context, the longhouse form here has to address the same issues of light and air protection and privacy. Our point of departure, something that we could use to explore the form, and I'm just going to go back quickly, oops, was light-hearted to start with. The Imperial Star Cruiser and the Blue Flame, which was at some point the fastest vehicle on Earth, I understand. But these oblique reference points helped us to explore the way that the long building could perch over the top of the rise, how the spaces within could be manipulated and how the volumes, both internally and externally, could fold and wrap to accommodate the program and the context. So externally, in this climate, the house needed to protect, and this long western facade was designed as a protective sheath over the building. The adjustable panels let in light and air whilst protecting from the southwestern, harsh southwestern weather conditions, and gave us privacy from the neighbours, which you can't see in this shot, but do exist just off to the right. And you can see here on the site, the long eastern side wall, which is on the bottom of the plan there, is cut away in plan and section. The building's volume is cut away to wrap around and open up to the tea tree thicket, creating courtyards and alcoves to protect from the prevailing winds and revealing, when we do that, these softer materials, timber, battened cladding. And then at each end of the house, it's closed off, using these prosaic materials and fittings which are pragmatically attached to the front and rear elevations. So the FC sheet here is detailed in a very traditional way of many beach houses, battens covering all the joints, and all perched on this unadorned concrete block retaining walls that go into the sand uh, the the sand dune site. And at the front there, the screened veranda on the first floor can be opened up when the house is occupied. And the garage here is really the main front door. And then it's the little things, the little details. The perforated screen over the metre box here creates a very temporal house number when the sun shines, which is not always reliable in Venus Bay. And at the rear of the house, the house rests gently over the edge of the ridge, the sand, the sand dune ridge, as if it's just landed. With the new tea tree and banksia planting, you can see in the foreground there, which is now revegetating that, that sort of exposed southern slope. Internally within the house, the spaces are sparse. Oops, just trying to catch up there. Sparse, robust for a beach house, very unadorned. And that's part of the philosophy of the house. So it's seeking to expand on this idea of the ethos of a typical local beach house, designed as much as possible to be self-contained as an entity. When it's not being occupied, it just sits very quietly on the hill. It's designed to be pragmatic, unadorned, honest, I suppose a bit of a retreat from the extremes of heat and cold, rain and wind on the site. The next project's also a residential project. And in this project, we start exploring some different ideas. The idea is about how a traditional home can be adapted to embrace different models of housing. In this case, multi-generational, flexible housing connected to its surroundings. So it's a late Victorian house. You can see it in the centre of the streetscape there. Um, with a very uninspiring 90s addition at the rear. Very inward looking, disconnected and very constrained in its accommodation on what was a very um, generous site for the inner city. So the premise here of the transformation was to place the garden at the centre of the home, 
using this as a device to break apart the traditional idea of building as being the totality of the home. And expanding this to look at the whole of the site, freeing up those, the arrangement of required programmatic spaces, bringing these back together through the connecting device of the garden. And the resulting flexible series of indoor and outdoor spaces actively linked to the original house, actively linked the original house and the new additions with its garden, with its spaces. The new work is arranged, arranged around it is always conceived in relationship back to the garden. And these are the new spaces. An in situ concrete garden room, um, which sits at the rear of the site. And this book ends the garden, placing the garden back at the centre of the home. And within this space, we use permeable walls between the internal spaces and the garden. And the garden room faces back to the reconfigured original house, where again, and we're trying to make the edge ambiguous between the garden and the indoor spaces. We co-opt the external spaces, the leftover bits. So the small outdoor areas around the house and the garden room are reclaimed as part of those living spaces and as green backdrops to those living spaces. We try and dissolve the edges between the garden and the internal spaces. And the pavilion itself, it's a bedroom, it's sometimes a study, it can be a self-contained separate living area, comes complete with bathroom and kitchen. It's also a garage and a workshop, except when it's a play space. And in the future it might have other possible uses that we're yet to consider. And in the detail, the built structures always defer to the garden as well. So there was four significant original trees on the site and all of them have been retained. The building wraps around these. You can see here there's a, a sort of 40-year-old magnolia tree and the building's been pushed back to wrap around that. Um, elsewhere there's a 100-year-old um, tree fern that the building has had to, to arch over. And the materials themselves have been chosen to weather with the garden. The solidity of the concrete ages into the ground, the galvanising will silver and soften over time, and the, weather, the timber itself will, will go silver, um, unless our boat building client who insists on oiling everything to death has um, his say in it. But the patterns in the landscape are also important. They're used to bleed the edges, to transform the hard spaces into soft spaces. And the desire here is always for the garden, the landscape, to dominate. The new buildings and the garden itself are augmentations. They extend the way the original house works for the family who live on, in it, along with their friends and many visitors. And so the new built forms work both as an extension of the original house, as does the garden, but also when they need to as separate entities and sometimes, you know, something in between. The last residential project, um, this is fairly recent, this was completed last year, and working largely in an urban context and often dealing with existing buildings means that our preoccupations are often about the impact of that particular context, how we live and work in close quarters to each other, how we provide light and air on confined sites, and how we create a sense of spaciousness where there's often little space to go around. So in this house, we found a nondescript single-storey timber cottage. You can see at the centre, of, well, just off, off to slightly to the right from the centre of that photo, um, a series of brick and weatherboard additions crammed in behind it. But in the streetscape, in this urban context, it sat at a confluence point um, in the streetscape where on the right there was a new continuous row of terraces and down the left the streetscape breaks down for a bit, becomes the backyards of the warehouses that face the rear lane behind that looks something like this. But what this meant was that the traditional suburban block pattern, the building towards the front of the house and the open space towards the back of the house, that couldn't be relied upon in this case to allow access to natural light or air. The house itself was well and truly penned in by its neighbours. So we set about giving the new home some breathing space. So how did we do that? We retained the original cottage, in the end really just two rooms at the front of the house that you can see at the top left there. 
removed the unsympathetic additions and decided to set the new additions away from the back of the cottage. We did this by inserting a light well immediately behind the cottage and then on the eastern side of the light well at the rear we established three new masonry volumes which slide down the southern end of the site, each one made thinner than the next, like tubes of a telescope, enabling the site to be opened up along the northern side to maximise valuable open space, light and air. In section, the upper level of the house holds the private spaces, the bedrooms and bathroom. The original cottage um, becomes bedroom wing for the kids, and at the rear, you cross a bridge across the, the light well um, to get to the master suite and bathroom. And along the lower level, these are the, this is the communal program, the kitchen, living, dining, study spaces, all located here, with the kitchen reaching out along the lower courtyard. And then the tube extends down the site, folding down a long staircase to the lower courtyard and extending down to the rear lane, which is really the, the main entry of the house, the day-to-day -day entry through the which the family access the local park and come into the house on a day-to-day -day basis. So this programmatic and spatial arrangement then sets up a series of sectional configurations, a wide variety of sectional configurations, each one being manipulated to bring light and air into the narrow site. And whilst the two long elevations of the building are largely hidden, effectively unseen, the ends of the tube that you can see here, the street and the laneway, the west and the west, present quite different material and compositional responses to their different contexts. So at the front, the local planning instruments in this particular council area stipulated that original timber cottages, single storey cottages in specifically, had to be retained. And traditional wisdom might say that you then restore that as faithfully as possible, which is very noble in principle. But in the case of this house, there was very little of the original fabric that was um, retained, or very little of the original fabric that was actually original. So our design response was to retain as much of the timber cottage as possible, whether original or not. And by simply painting it black, on the outside and inside white, the details and the material were reduced in an effort to bring the form of the building, which is really the only truly original part of the cottage, to the fore. And as you get closer to the building, some of the details are revealed and the internal starts to become visible. The original hallway, which is lined in these white Regency boards, frames those newer spaces that you move through to beyond. And you can see here, we've also pulled the ceiling out of this hallway so you see the original framework of the roof above and created a mezzanine up above those rooms. But the other way to approach the house off the laneway, which is the day-to-day -day entrance, is a different context and uses a more robust material treatment. So this palette of materials is signified by the street number and the gate hardway, hardware. And this announces the main palette of materials for the house, for the new house, which is locally made sandstock bricks and concrete roofs. The lower courtyard, seen through here through the, the doors that open onto the laneway, is set in this matching hue of decomposed granite to offset the bricks, again reducing that palette of materials. And from the main rear entry, you go through this tall stairway leading up to the kitchen and courtyard spaces, the thin end of the telescope that I showed you before. The kitchen, the next space, is also long and thin and faces north, opening up to the courtyard to capture the sun that can be accessed in the middle of the site. And here you can see the, the roof of that kitchen showing how this volume slides out of the living spaces beyond. The roof's insulated with um, an aloe garden which des is designed by um, Sue Barnsley, the landscape architect we work with. And it's shown here in its fledgling state but it's, um, it's gone quite berserk. It's a fantastic garden and it's got this wonderful serendipity about it because the client's father was a aloe collector in South Africa. So there's just all these extra layers of meaning around the, the choice of landscaping. So internally in the kitchen, it's lined with rich warm materials, smoked oak, the evergreen marble on the bench top and bronze mirror, 
All of these contrast with this robust concrete and brick palette that you find in the house. The kitchen leads through to the house beyond that next volume that it slides out of, each space designed to capture as much light and air as possible. Wherever possible, we try and do that from two sides. So here, there's the windows behind um, getting light and air, and it leads through, you can see through to the light well space beyond, um, and the dining room beyond. And internally, the walls are all bagged brick. Some are existing brick, which we retained from the old additions, wherever we could, um, along with some of the concrete floors, which again are this mixture of old and new. And we've used this overlay of Tasmanian blackwood joinery and metalwork to contrast with that robust palette, just bringing each element into relief. And um, little details like this remnant bit of sandstone that's left exposed, which gives you a sense, a reminder of where you are in relation to the ground plane. And underneath the existing cottage, the dining room just slips in under the, the, um, the cottage rooms and has this little hidden study off to the side. But really, the main, the main event in this house is the light well. It's the space that gives the house space to breathe. It's been deliberately left without program. And in inclement weather, you can slide a glazed roof across it, so it can always be occupied. It can always be connected. The spaces can remain connected. But it's connected to the sky. And rather than separating the spaces, the light well acts as this sort of generous spatial ligature, an opportunity for light and shade that connects the public and the communal zones in a way that's unexpected in, in quite a constrained site. Again, that idea of generosity of space on a tight site where you don't have a lot of space to play with. Across the other side of the light well on the upper level, there's a master bedroom utilising that same palette seen throughout the house and a small bathroom just hidden in behind it, warmer toned materials as this overlay to the, the robust masonry walls and concrete roof. And all of these moves create this sense of robustness, um, but it's also a home for a busy family of four, a house that provides calm spaces for living that's engaged with its occupants, but ultimately stripped back to the essentials of what's really needed for this family home. So I'm going to move on now to some of our public work. Um, and as Sandra was saying earlier, it has been a bit of a slow burn for our pro practice. We started dealing mainly with residential alts and ads. And we've used the work that we've done there to, to learn and to practice um, approaches to our work that we've then translated into now the public realm. This is a relatively small public project, but it demonstrates how we've taken some of those principles and applied them in a different way. And it's working with landscape again. So working with landscape is something that we're really deeply interested in because buildings don't sit in isolation. They're creatures that live in a habitat. Sometimes that's man-made, sometimes that's natural, urban. Um, and this next project at Cohen Park, which is in Sydney, um, is a uh, local park, much loved, well used um, in the inner west of Sydney. But this gave us an opportunity to bring the existing functions on, on the site and some new functions and elements of the park together to restructure it in a cohesive composition that could revitalise the park for the local community. Um, just a bit of context, um, Cohen Park's part of a series of linked spaces, um, public open spaces that are arranged along the creek you can see there and leads down to Sydney Harbour. But the park facilities we found when we started the project um, were in fairly poor condition there was a playing field, some tennis courts, some rather permanent looking temporary storage and a toilet block. Um, this asphalted heat up area, but all in very dilapidated condition with very poor physical connections and really limited sight lines. So you didn't really know where one thing was in relation to the other in the park. It needed a significant upgrade on a very limited budget. So presented with this compromised but potentially engaging site, 
our solution was to try and use the existing structures and the topography of the site to reconnect those programs and establish a cohesive arrangement of spaces and facilities. And the landscape context here was critical. Um, the building didn't sit in isolation, but would be a creature that would live in both a man-made and a natural habitat. So, first of all, the playing fields you can see located along the creek, and its relationship to the tennis courts in blue there, which sat about a metre below the playing fields. And then a really important element was... Oops, I think it's come up. Yep. Um, oh, you can see it there, it slips slightly off the the um, photo, but a existing um, brick wall, which was a remnant of an existing factory building. And this is an aerial from the 1950s, and you can see the, the factory wall there. I'm not quite sure why that slipped up a little bit, but um, that wall runs along the edge of the laneway. So the key move here, oh sorry, and at the centre of all of that, there was a collection of um, facilities. Um, this blockage, old amenities, water tanks, some storage, and all created this blockage at the three um, activity areas, blocking the sight lines, impeding access, and generally obstructing and dividing the park. So we looked to rearrange the elements within the landscape, not so much to create a cohesive whole, but rather to create a linked series of spaces, a linked series of interventions that could unlock the park. And the key move here was to relocate the amenities buildings and the storage, designing this new building at the pivot point of the three park activity areas. And so this now acts as a fulcrum. Oops. Just going to go back one. Um, this now acts as a fulcrum in the park composition. So rather than creating a blockage, it sits astride this remnant wall and links the levels, creates clear sight lines and opens up all the areas of the park. And then around the new building, we worked with those existing levels of the playing field and the courts. We inserted a series of low walls and seats and this created both level areas and spectator seating that could overlook the parks. We inserted walkways and steps that created uh, equitable access paths from the car park, which was also newly created, all the way through to the activity areas and to the amenities. We added goals and nets to the courts to expand the range of facilities in the park. And then really importantly, integrated a layer of landscape to provide shade and softer, greener backdrop for all of the hard court spaces. And the new amenities building, as it sits now, really acts as this central hub for park activities. It connects, it organises, and it, it just enhances all the activities around it. It also creates an pre open presence on the laneway. And this is a suburban area. It doesn't have the benefit of high passerby traffic, so it was really important to open up to that laneway and create sight lines from the houses um, to the park. But the building itself is composed to respond to its context. It's both solid and robust. Um, but at the same time, it has to be a generous structure. It has to reach out to the park. So we knew the building had to be tough, and we've got this robust brick base, but the, the soaring cantilevered roof structure um, opens up sight lines between the park and the building and the surrounding areas. So wherever possible, We've made use of the space around the building as well. We've taken advantage of the changes in level that you can see here. This is the seating that overlooks the refurbished courts. We've retained and refurbished elements. Um, an existing sandstone wall is used as the edge of a new walkway that links um, and creates equitable access through all the areas. And the remnant brick wall that you can see here has been revamped as a hit up wall, complete with a hand painted Magic Cuts unicorn. Um, which is also sports storage for the courts and it's used by all the local clubs. And that wall that you can see on the right-hand side there then wraps around the corner and slices through the new building. You can see that from the lower level and also from the higher level here on the left-hand side, seeing that wall um, running in and through the new building. And then looking back towards the park, you can see how the building creates its own forecourt. On the right-hand side, is a really beautiful gum tree and it had a tree 
protection zone, a root zone around which we couldn't build. Um, and so it, it uses this. The, the cantilever is a structural response to that. We couldn't have footings in that root zone. But it's also a design response. It's the canopy of the building reaching out to the canopy of the tree. The outdoor basin below is another way of that building reaching out into the park and connecting with the park. And the cantilever also does other things. It's composed to eliminate the need for multiple layers of structure. It creates a zone for light and air so it's open between the blades. The perforations in the fibre cement ceiling allow this filtered natural light through and minimise the use of artificial lighting in the space. And the open zone below the cantilever um, creates cross-ventilation through the spaces, natural cross-ventilation. And the amenities take their material cue from that remnant brick wall, building this robust masonry enclosure, but then using that, those prosaic materials to um, create compositions, creating beautiful compositions out of everyday materials that solve the functional requirements of the building. And those pragmatic considerations, things like bird proofing, graffiti proofing, and maintenance are dealt with inherently in the materials of the building. So the um, battened doors and screen there are very unappealing to graffiti artists because they just distort their work. So they haven't been graffitied at all. Where we've got brickwork, it's very open to the public view and it's barely been touched. Um, the steel work is designed to address cross ventilation and the little spikes there, which we really like as part of the composition, deal with the bird proofing issues. And things such as these elements here, which were leftover bricks um, from the building, and it would have been such a shame to just send them back. So we used them and inserted them into the concrete seats and the walkways as a bit of a skateboard deterrent. <laughs> Um, council's requirement, not ours. <laughs> but all, all composed to be both beautiful and practical. There's no reason why we can't have both. So now this small little project um, has really transformed the use and inhabitation of the park. It's not just an amenities building. It's um, an element that brings together a composition of elements in ha that inhabit the landscape of the park. It deals with things such as, ideas such as lightness and solidity, but explores at the same time these concepts of safe, equitable, accessible public space. And the last project, which I'm going to talk about tonight, which is also going back to dealing with existing building stock. So working with existing building stocks become a bit of a preoccupation for our practice. Um, we like doing it on a number of fronts. It's a very sustainable way of building, um, keeping things that work, adapting things to make them work again, breathing new life into the old and responding to and revealing and enhancing the character of our existing buildings. But this, of course, brings with it considerable challenges, particularly when dealing with significant listed heritage buildings and heritage contexts. So this next project tested us a bit with how to transform a building that strongly, so strongly spoke of its past, um, but we had to give it a viable future in which it can be used and appreciated with a new use. So the, this is our building. It is the former number four police station, which meant that it was the fourth one. Um, uh, designed in the early 1880s in the form of a Palladian city gate by government architect James Barnett. And the original building operated as a police station and cell block until about 1974 and um, was owned and managed by Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority, which is an arm of state government, who had done a number of studies and wanted to give this building a new life, a new use, um, as either a cafe or a restaurant. But to do that, there were, as I said, many challenges. This really strong stone facade, the raised portico, all of these elements are designed to impress. They speak of authority, even intimidation. They're not very inviting. Access was really limited, particularly for those who are less able, and visibility into the building from the street was almost non-existent. And at the rear of the building, um, there was a former courtyard coming off this building. It had been unceremoniously chopped off. And 
the cell block that then is exposed to the rear did very little to engage or activate um, this walkway, which is an important public walkway in the rocks called Nurses Walk. So our challenges were threefold. We had to provide all the services and programmatic requirements of a restaurant within the constraints of this heritage listed building. We had to open up the building to signify this new use, provide equitable access to the public and activate those public frontages. And importantly, we had to design contemporary insertions of material quality that responded to the inherent strength of the building that we found. So to do this, we conceived of the new work as a series of cassettes, things that could be inserted where the opportunities of the building allowed. Um, on the left-hand side, um, a commercial kitchen block was inserted into this former exercise yard, which floats within the space. It doesn't connect to the building. It's fully removable. Um, in front of that, a new entry cassette was inserted between the brick walls, providing a new accessible entry into the building. And to the right-hand side there, um, a new dining room was inserted along that nurse's walk frontage. So all these new elements, finely detailed in steel and glass, were inserted into the spaces between the existing brick walls and sandstone walls, allowing the structure and the composition of the original building to be the organising principle of the new design. For the dining room, this tripartite elevation reflected the arrangement of spaces behind it. The cell blocks are arranged along this central corridor. And the edges of these new inserts just ever so slightly overhang the stone base as if it's been slid into place. Um, at the rear of that insertion, a glazed roof strip um, exists between the new insertion and the building as if it hasn't quite made it into position. And it allows the building to really lightly touch the old wall. It also allows the light, the natural light, to flood down that new wall. So your view's drawn into the building and to the texture and the detail of the original wall behind. But the activation of the walkway of Nurses Walk was key. So these double hung windows um, on the dining space allow that to read almost as a porch or a veranda. And the building's seeking this sense of openness and transparency, but it's responding to that inherent strength of the original building. So the material language, steel, bronze, glass, is detailed to be both robust and simultaneously refined reflecting the qualities of the heritage building, but opening it up to these new possibilities. The new entry space is designed to be complementary to, not subservient to, the main entry off George Street, so that it can resolve these issues of adaptation and equitable access. The entry has to be clearly different, but of equal value to the main entry, an elegant alternative so people don't feel like they're coming in the back door. It also can be a light field transition space, so it's a place to stop, to pause, to sort of adjust and reorientate as you enter the building. But the porch space, which is probably the main event, is the most critical part of the adaptation. So apart from its contribution to the enlivening the public walkway, it also is the wheelchair accessible dining area. It's very difficult to get access further into the building because of the constraints of the building. And it's the pathway into the main building. And within the building, the hallway then provides access to the cell rooms, each one of them transformed into either a dining space or some of them into amenities for the building within the cells. With the colour scheme being a reinterpretation of some of the more vivid periods of the building's history, but then the cell doors carefully scrape back to reveal the underlying steel complete with the fabrication branding that we found underneath, but still retaining paint remnants that reveal the many colours and layers of the, that the doors have been painted before. And throughout the building, the contemporary insertions carefully place the old within the new, signifying that, that new use and openness of the building. So, just going back, those brass handrails and the floating brass overlay do a number of things. They're an accessibility device, but they also protect the building 
um, and highlight the original fabric. It's just that sense of a new use, the sense that you're invited into the building. The heavy steel doors had to be held in place, so here it's simply done with brass pins and brackets. And the finely detailed brass grates here help the old meet the new fabric. Here you can see there's a new handrail on the portico verandas. So that does, again, simultaneously many things. It upgrades the balustrade protection, but then it turns up at the end and has these integrated lights that wash the ceiling with light. And that creates this inviting space, both from within, but also from the street to sort of signify this new use of the building. And on the front facade, these very subtle but meaningful insertions, so the new handrails that protrude slightly into the public domain to, again, signify that, that new openness. And behind the door there um, is a glazed airlock, so that door can remain open whilst the building's trading um, and in all weather conditions without it having to be closed when it's cold or, or hot when the air conditioning's on. But ultimately for us, the success of this adaptation is in that celebration of the imposing and austere qualities of the former police station building that we hope we've achieved whilst simultaneously breathing this new life um, into the building and the adjacent public domain, providing internal spaces required for this new use, but responding to the new uses without losing this essence of the old. So that's the last project in detail, but just very quickly and perhaps to complement what Sandra was saying earlier, I'd like to just quickly take you through some of our new things, things that we're currently working on or have recently finished. So this building, another heritage building in the rocks, we seem to be doing a lot of work there at the moment, and we've just completed this transformation of a former 1880s hotel building into what is becoming the contemporary pub, the microbrewery and tap rooms, with a design that we hope um, has taken its cue from the details and the character of the old building. So here you can see the beautiful arched windows. These have been reinterpreted in the new light fittings that we've designed throughout the space. The richness of the wallpaper there has been reinterpreted in all the new finishes that we've used throughout the building. So again, that idea of a responsive design approach, but here on a very detailed level. And another project we're working on, um, this one's on the drawing board at the moment, on the southern New South Wales coast. So again, this idea of responding to context. In this case, a childcare centre, but um, placed in a very inhospitable car park. So how do we do that? The idea that we can create this sanctuary for children a place where they can explore and play and learn in a really safe environment. And the very last one, one that we're particularly excited about, also down on the southern New South Wales coast, an abandoned hotel that you can see just on the top left corner there on this extraordinary cliffside site. And um, the challenge of finding a way to reinvent this place without you losing the essence of what it what it's been in the past and also where it is. And so it's this building per dramatically perched on a, on a cliff. And we took this photo one day and there's this amazing sun flare off the, the building, reminding us of a, a lighthouse lamp sort of glinting on the headland. So again, that idea of taking a device, a point of departure, and we've now got this, lamp, this lighthouse lamp lantern concept, providing a scaffold for our exploration of this building and its new life, and, um, and exploring how that might help us unlock the promise of the building. And so I suppose that's a small glimpse into our practice over the last 13 years, and the idea of being modern-ish, this idea, it's a loose approach. It's an approach that gives us flexibility to investigate ideas of context, of landscape, memory, material, meaning, culture, an approach that we'll continue to explore as we continue to practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. It's so impressive to see such mastery of strategy and detailing um, by a single practice. 
But what we didn't see is the how. So we, we saw a lot of the, the outcomes. So hopefully, Leonie Matthews, who's going to be our panellist, will be able to probe into the how. How do you get there? Well, thanks, Chris. That was you know, great to see like a, you know, a quick survey of your work. You know, and um, and I was aware of some of those things. Oh, good. I've seen them published. Yeah. But um, I guess I wanted to start maybe going back a step in terms of maybe in response to Sandra's The How. I wondered that you've started the practice in 2004, David, and yourself. What happened before that? And, you know, are there important mentors or important lessons? Because your work, you know, is very... You know, it's the, it's quiet, and you you know this slow burn is something you know, that yeah. you've been talking about, but but really rich and you know very sensitive. What what went before that? You know, because there must be a before two thousand and four. Um, yes, there was a number of years before, <laughs> um, and I suppose David and I both practiced. We we practiced for a while in the UK, and I think one of the things about working um, in in England is that. Um, you know, the whole of London's pretty much listed. So there's limited opportunities to build new and you do have to be um, careful and considered about what you do. And you also have to be inventive about what you do, how to adapt places, how to, to find opportunities within existing building st stock and within, you know, often very tight constraints. Um, so that's probably one of the, the sort of more formative um, periods of the, yeah. of the before, I think. And then coming back to Australia and, um, and that one of the other things in the UK is that you can, you can do pretty much anything. If you want to, you know, um, finally detail something or design a piece of furniture or invent a new system, um, there is a sort of... Um, an, uh, the availability of labour... Um, in the UK and Europe, there's always somebody who can do it for you. And so it allows you to think beyond what might be the obvious pragmatic off response, off-the-shelf off response. Um, coming back to Australia, what we found was that it's, um, it's much harder to do that sometimes when you don't have um, the um, available trade expertise, perhaps, or... Um, sometimes the willingness to do things that are not the norm, to build in a way that may not necessarily be more difficult, but it's just not the way it's usually done. So we've had to work hard at doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Mentors? Oh, mentors. That's a really tough mm. one. Are there any? You know. Um, uh, let me think. Um, I might speak on behalf of David if... Very quickly. <laughs> David worked for Zanus Associates and for James Gross, and I think that's definitely influenced some of the, the direction of the practice. Yeah. Um, and in the UK, worked um, for a firm over there, which um, the name escapes me, Lifshitz Davidson, who also um, you know, had a very sensitive approach. Um, myself, I worked for Carolyn Pitcock in Sydney and working on very small scale buildings and just learning the craft of how to put a building together um, piece by piece, supervising work on site. That was a very formative experience, yeah. I think. Yeah. Now, thinking about that, you've, I'm going to jump here a little bit, but the projects that you've talked about and you've and you know, we've spoken about this the importance then in terms of you know starting with small projects and then where you kind of place yourself and how you've kind of moved the practice and the role yeah. that awards have, yep. have play, taken in terms of developing the practice so I'm, i am making a bit of a jump here but <laughs> trying to unpack this how as well but i mean i think when we started um one of our early projects um, we, we entered the awards, the Institute Awards, um, from the early days. So our very pro first project we entered and we got a commendation, which was a very big boost and gave us a bit of confidence, I suppose, about then taking the leap into private practice because that first project was done moonlighting for other firms. Um, and then one, one of our early projects after that won the first Small Projects Award in New South Wales. 
And that was fantastic. But it also perhaps um, had a flip side that it's very easy to get typecast as the people who do small well. And I think we do do small well, but what we had to do was kind of demonstrate to people that we could do other things well at, at, um, in addition to that. And how the, the problem solving that you need to do on a small project, which is often incredibly complex because it is a small project, how that translates to larger projects. So one of the um, projects I showed, the Fitzroy Terrace, um, we entered that into the awards in, I think, 2009, and um, it, we could have put it into alts and ads, but we put it into the heritage category, and um, it won not only an award, but it got the Greenway Medal that year, which is the named award in New South Wales. And what that did was it sort of shifted the focus from us doing small alts and ads to being able to do other things. And from there, um, uh, we were then exposed to a whole range of different clients and different project types, and particularly public work. So the police station project that I showed probably sprang in part from, from that exposure of doing heritage work. And then from that, we've then moved into other public buildings. Um, the tap rooms that I showed there came from doing heritage work but has allowed us to expand now into doing hospitality work. So it's positioning yourself. Each project is not just about one thing, it's about many things. And using those leaps in program or maybe in context to um, allow you to shift what you do. Another aspect to your project, uh, to your practice, is also teaching. Um, would you like to kind of talk about that a little bit? Um, yes. So we... <laughs> um, teaching is great. It's a little bit like doing talks like this. So it forces you to think about your work in different ways. It forces you to articulate your process, um, to articulate your ideas. And um, in doing that, it often tests your ideas. Um, so students will sometimes ask me, so why did you do it that way? And sometimes in the studio, the way, because David and I have been working together for such a long time, we have a bit of a shorthand about how we go about designing together. And sometimes that's unspoken. And so to have to verbalise it and articulate your position and your ideas, um, and also articulate what you think about other people's ideas, really helps your, um, lifts you up, you know, pushes, pushes you to think about architecture in a different way. Now, you came into the studio I'm teaching at the moment, Adaptive Capacities, yeah. and, you know, and had a glimpse of that. I wonder, one of the things that, that in that studio we've been sort of questioning is, you know, the, the time when the Borough yeah. Charter was written in 72 and how things might have changed in the way that's written and how, where you see kind of your work and yeah. whether you've you know, got any thoughts on that as well. The because I think that's, you know, part of that teaching has, you know, because you know, the students, it's all, this is all kind of ancient history, but of course we've gone through that, that yeah. change of you know, heritage legislation that's relatively new in Australia. Yeah, and I think the, the Borough Charter, I mean, we, we often refer to it with clients um, because there is, I forget what particular section of it, and we were perhaps a little bit selective in how we use it, but it, it's this idea that each section of the building should read as being in and of its time. So the last thing that we would ever consider doing is trying to pretend that the new elements of our work are somehow part of that old building. That we really love this idea that um, the new elements of the work can actually enhance the old building. It's, it puts it, sets it into relief. It, it sort of, it, it's like having you know, a view of the ocean, but you don't really understand the ocean without the coastline. So you need that contrast. You need the difference between the two. And in your studio today, I was talking to some of the students about that. They've got new elements and old elements, and, but you'd often look at some of the designs and see that they're struggling with that idea of how to, how to mediate between them, what, how to keep the best of the old whilst changing it into something that works for the new. 
Um, and it's a really difficult thing, you know, how those two things meet. Yeah, that, yeah. that ongoing challenge. I wonder, do, do you think there's room now, you know, because we see work coming from other places, you know, cities that are much older perhaps than cities in Australia, and, and I, you know, being West Australian, look at some of the, the alts and ads or things that are, you know, in residential that are done to buildings that in Perth would, you know, people would never spend the money yeah. on, you know, so it, you've, you've, it, there's a quite different marketplace <laughs> as well going on and yeah. you've got things that are protected, you know, well protected and you have, you can't do anything, whereas, you know, in other places where that's not and how, you know, you're kind of dealing with, I guess, an economic thing but also, you know, these sort of local government or um, community requirements for things sure. to stay, you know, perhaps it's, you know, is stay it nostalgic is. or, you know, it stay, Look, it stays is and is it worth keeping? Yeah, and a lot of it is nostalgic and, you know, some of the controls, you know, we, we um, don't necessarily kind of work to the letter of it. You know, it's like the Annandale House where the intention of the, um, the DCP in that particular government area around um, heritage single storey timber cottages, very specific was this idea that they are just retained. Mm. Um, but no nuance to that. And yet much of that cottage was not original. They're being, you know, mucked around with lots of things have been replaced, windows have been replaced. So what is it, what is the essence of that that is worth keeping? Yeah. And I think that's what we try and do is um, say, well, what is it that's really worth keeping? What is it that's of value? And sometimes that's nostalgic, sometimes that's... Um, uh, a memory um, that refers to the history of a place. Um, sometimes it's economic, sometimes it's a sustainability issue. Uh, quite often it's all of them together. And, you know, sometimes we choose to keep things and we're not required to, but, you know, if it's working and it's working well, why change it? Because th there's a wastefulness, I suppose, in that approach. Um, we try to make sure that everything we do is a considered decision. It's a, it's a decision that's made on, on the basis of all of those criteria. Yeah, I, I really liked your description of this jumping off point, you know, in projects, that idea that, you know, each project is a new opportunity for exploration. Yeah. Do you, um, I, I kind of guess I'm going to wrap up now if that's... You know, you, you show, I was going to ask you, you know, what, what projects you've got on your um, on at the moment. And you said that, but what do you see happening, you know, in the next couple of years for your practice? Um, big things, we hope. But yeah. um, I think we're a practice now of about eight, yeah. um, and we quite like that number. We sort of we like to sort of sit between eight and twelve, and I, you know, we could possibly take on larger projects at that scale. So. It's, it's a good number. It allows David and I to still be across all of the projects in the office. It allows us to still be architects um, because the danger of sometimes going to larger scales of pra practice is that you end up being more of a manager and less of an architect. Um, and so we're hoping that within that kind of studio context that we've got that we can explore different ideas. We really enjoy working in public buildings. We'd like to do more of that. Um, the childcare centre has been a really fantastic project and love the idea of starting to work in education and creating spaces for children. Um, and that, that idea, that jumping off point, I think no matter what projects start to come our way, we'll, we'll be always looking for those opportunities, looking for, you know, that little left of centre idea that helps us unlock the promise of those projects. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was fabulous. It was a really enjoyable evening. I learned a lot about your practice, even though we've had conversations many times. They don't enter into that serious territory, so it was really fabulous to um, learn more about your practice in that way. Um, I neglected to mention next week's lecture and I was thinking what I might do and I didn't um, prep David on this because Chris has mentioned David a number of times and of course he's just here in the front. Can you come up? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Over to you, David. I thought I might get David to tell you why to come next week and listen to William Smart. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra, for the opportunity <laughs> to talk about William's work, who I've never met. You've never met him? No. No, we've been in the same room many times. But let me talk about him. <laughs> Sit yourselves down. Oh, you are. Um, That's bizarre. How could you have not met him? I don't know, I'm shy. I don't get out much. <laughs> H- hence, Chris I taking the stage. Leonie's going to tell you why. I could I introduce <laughs> Leonie again <laughs> to... <laughs> Sorry, David. Not at all. Please. You, you've seen the work, but I know... Okay. I, so we could do a, you know, duo. I'll do a bit and then I'll disappear okay. into the Go shadows. On then. You and do we can your bit. <laughs> Look, I think William's, William's one of those architects who's doing some wonderful, thoughtful work. And I think right at this moment... You he's... just described yourselves. Have I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> William, along with ourselves, is one of those architects <laughs> who uh, is just doing some fantastic work at the moment. But I think if... Like work like the Indigo Slam, which one, which is on the right hand side of the screen there, just one of the most fantastic, unusual houses that has been produced in Australia in the last ten years or so, maybe more. Um, it's a house that I I've wandered past for the last few years as it's been built, and it's unlike anything that I've seen for quite a while. If nothing else, just come to hear what William says about that building. Um, but he's also doing some wonderful um, multi-residential houses as well, multi-residential buildings. There's some of them on the left there. Uh, and he's doing a, quite a, a wide range of work. Um, and I think he's one of the most exciting architects that are working, that's working in Australia at the moment. That's the reason why you should come and hear him talk next week. Thank you. That was fabulous. Thank you. You want to add one one sentence to that? No, you're good. I think that's good. Okay, I have. He's a lovely man. He's a really lovely yeah, man. Very, you really should meet speaker. each other. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the bizarrest things about Sydney, is that I would often introduce people who you, you know you go, oh William, meet David, and they'd be like, yeah, we're brothers, or they've never met each other before, and you can never predict. It's very strange, isn't it? It's a very strange place. And hear William talk because I went to Indigo Slam last year when I was chair of the residential jury in New South Wales and it, it, in that building are some of the most amazing spaces I have seen in buildings in Australia. They are, like David said, unlike um, much of our um, Australian aesthetic perhaps and they just explore ideas of materiality and light in a really... Um, masterful way. The stairwell at Indigo Slam is one of my favourite spaces I've ever been into. Very good. So I have one more task for tonight, which is to announce the Archive Spy winner, which is Kay Austin. Not sure if... A second year student. Excellent. Good for you. Great. What else do I have to do? That's it. You can all go home. Enjoy the evening and thanks for coming.